Now, a special hour, University of the Streets, to educate, agitate, and organize, brings you the most important historian of the 20th and 21st century, the legendary, prolific, with at least 40 books to his name, and at least two of which will be made available to you today for your contribution to WBAI. They haven't even hit the stores yet, just for you. And we're calling that package, I want you to keep that in mind as we listen, breaking news. And who am I speaking about? Well, none other than what William Lauren Katz, an old friend of the station and a great historian himself, now transitioned, called the National Treasurer, Gerald Horn, a national treasure indeed, who reveals the economic and ideological structure of U.S. society and how it's propagated that causes the masses to turn to authoritarianism, even though it is against their interests. Well, his response, the healthy alternative he proposes, is a form of workers' democracy, if you will, which will flesh out more, whereby those who do the actual work make the decisions as to what, how, and why. And we welcome Dr. Gerald Horn to our University of the Streets, which he is creating for us, WBAI's Equal Rights and Justice. It's good to have you with us, Dr. Horn. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I want to, you know, riff off of that general theme about the uh, economic and ideological structure of society, how it's put forward that causes people to turn to authoritarianism, even though it's against their interests. And I want to begin by really we're looking at the media uh, the fourth estate, if you will, that is the major structural mechanism by which people absorb information. Now, we can pay tribute to uh, Ed Herman and Noam Shopsky, who educated us somewhat on how people absorb information with their uh, important manufacturing consent And what they essentially reveal in manufacturing consent is that, well, big money and big media have coupled to create a kind of Disney world of democracy, if you will, in which TV shows and televised debates and news coverage is being dumbed down, resulting in a public less informed than it should be taking news out of the journalism box, they say, and placing it into the entertainment box, which they maintain is severely hurting democracy and allowing special interests to manipulate the system. They then go uh, and talk about what that system really is. And that system is about, well, it's about the plutocracy. It's about big money interests. And they control and the networks and the networks are being consolidated. Media is being consolidated. And so, therefore, we get the ideological positions as advocated by the media. But I want to take it further and then look at that question of, okay, so power works to control and influence processes. But what's missing from that analysis that can help us really understand why great numbers of people absorb the bias, the backwardness, the upholding of capitalist ideology the positioning and actually extol the virtue of robber barons. What is it that's happening that we need to know that takes us beyond manufacturing consent? Well, we need a bit of history. That is to say that unbeknownst, I'm afraid to say, of many of our friends on the left, uh, there's been a plethora of scholarship in recent years that's fundamentally reshaping and reformatting our understanding of how we reach this perilous point. What I'm referring to 
or works looking at the origins of the United States, such as by Woody Holton at the University of uh, South Carolina, Robert Parkinson at SUNY Binghamton. I'm looking at all of the work that's emerged in recent years on the concept of settler colonialism. Recall that that fundamental concept was not invoked by many of our ideological ancestors, for example, but I can think of no better descriptor to analyze how it was that the European invaders uh, arrived in North America and liquidated the Native American population and enslaved the Africans. I'm looking at the concept of the construction of whiteness, another a concept that was alien to many of our ideological ancestors. Uh, this notion sheds light on how and why it was that those had been warring on the shores of Europe, uh, Christian uh, versus um, Jewish, English versus Irish, English versus Scots, British versus German, German versus Pole, Pole versus Russian, Serb versus Croat, Northern Italian versus Southern Italian. The list is endless. All of a sudden, when they cross the Atlantic, they are transmuted into this new politics of identity, if I can steal that phrase, this construction of whiteness. And that merger of those two concepts, that is to say settler colonialism and the construction of whiteness helps to deliver us to this concept of class collaboration. Because if you analyze the class background of the initial settlers arriving in North America under the English flag in the 16th century, they were from various class backgrounds, but all sponsored by the 1% in London, but with mutual ambition, which is, of course, to take the land. And that they succeeded in doing. And until we understand this concept of class collaboration, it becomes difficult to understand how and why it is that the media, particularly Fox News, develop such a stranglehold over the consciousness of so many, not least the consciousness of um, many of the descendants of the original settlers. Although if we are to believe uh, recent news reports, we should begin to think about whether or not uh, the right wing is extending its remit beyond its usual constituency, uh, speaking of Euro-Americans across class lines, into communities of color. What I want to read is a, uh, and, and continue to probe this more carefully, uh, certainly one of the greatest uh, scholars of all times, really. I want to read a, just a passage from Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. And I thought it was one of the most important descriptors as to why people uh, buy into uh, authoritarianism and white supremacy and the relative privilege that comes with that. And I'm just quoting from where the passages or the chapter where Du Bois is looking at the, the white worker. And it says, while revolt against the domination of the planters over the poor whites was voiced by men like Helper, who called for a class struggle to destroy the planters. This was nullified by deep-rooted antagonism to the Negro, whether slave or free. If black labor could be expelled from the United States or eventually exterminated, then the fight against the planter could take place. But the poor whites and their leaders could not for a moment contemplate a fight of united white and black labor against the exploiters. Indeed, the natural leaders of the poor whites, the small farmer, the merchant, the professional man, the white mechanic and slave overseer, were bound to the planters and repelled from the slaves and even from the mass of the white laborers in two ways. First, they constituted the police patrol who could ride with planters and now and then exercise unlimited force upon recalcitrant or runaway slaves. And then, too, there was always a chance that they themselves might also become planters 
by saving money, by investment, by the power of good luck. And the only heaven that attracted them was the life of the great southern planter. Take this and relate it again to that question of why people, for example, those who participated in January 6th or those who become the MAGA base, if you will, buy into authoritarianism and white supremacy despite their interests or objective interests. Does Du Bois help us understand that and translate that into contemporary understanding of why people buy the Fox News is? Well, I, th I think Du Bois certainly does help us to understand that concept. And studying those sentences you just read also reminds us to rethink the idea that the Euro-American working class and middle class that are seduced by the siren song of the Republican Party and by Fox News are acting against their material interests. Now, to a certain extent, that argument is credible. However, if the end game is going to involve a certain kind of expropriation of, for example, the black middle class and even those few who've attended, who've ascended to the uh, apex of the economic pyramid, then that wealth could then be distributed downward. I mean, if you look at what happened in Germany in the 1930s and the 1940s, which I think in some ways is analogous to what we're confronting today, many in Germany felt that they were benefiting from the looting and plunder of Bulgaria, of Greece, uh, of Poland, etc. They felt that there was a trickle down. Now, whether or not there was actually a trickle down is a separate matter to discuss. And that also brings me to the point I introduced at the top, which is that if you believe press reports, increasingly, this Fox News ideology is seeping into the consciousness of certain communities of color. And I put forward as Exhibit A, the man who just had the book thrown at him as a result of the January 6th insurrection, speaking of Enrique Tadio, who, as I understand it, is of Afro-Cuban descent, and yet is seen at least as the titular leader of the Proud Boys, who quite infamously Donald J. Trump himself gave a shout out to during one of his debates with Joseph R. Biden in the fall of 2020. Once again, the classical analysis helps us to unravel this apparent mystery insofar as the classical analysis tells us that the ruling ideas of any society are those of the ruling elite. And at a certain point, those ruling ideas do permeate the consciousness of even those who might be seen as the targets of the ruling elite, such as those of African and Latino ancestry. All that serves to illustrate the wider point, which is that we have a very steep uphill climb. And I think that that uphill climb can be assisted immeasurably by the fact that fortunately, as noted, a good deal of scholarship is serving to illuminate uh, some of the darkest corners of the history of the United States and pointing the way to a bright new future. Well, you know, there's, there's something, um, media's role as cheerleader, just to, to look at this as an issue, media's role as cheerleader in the clamor for, for war. For example, in the months preceding the March 19th, 2003 in, invasion of Iraq, 
How are we to understand how the mainstream press got it so wrong in the run-up to the uh, Iraq war? The story of how high officials misled the country has been told, surely. But they couldn't have done it on their own. They needed a compliant press to pass on their propaganda as news and cheer them on. How did the evidence disputing the existence of weapons of mass destruction and the link, for example, between Saddam Hussein saying to 9-11, go largely unreported. And it's not just the uh, reactionary media. This was the entire media that was compliant and complacent in the drive to, to, to war. So going again beyond, I think, manufacturing consent, or is that the total picture uh, to understand how mainstream journalists suspended their skepticism and scrutiny and how it remains an issue of significance that the media has not explored these issues. Well, I'm afraid to say that it goes far beyond the predilections of journalists in the corporate media. Uh, we would be better served by looking at the publishers in the corporate media. Uh, For example, Rupert Murdoch, the Australian U.S. billionaire who controls Fox News, who also controls a media empire that stretches from London to Australia. He is a card-carrying member of ruling classes in multiple countries, And a decision was made with regard to Iraq some two decades or so ago that it was in the best interest of the U.S. ruling class to invade Iraq for various reasons. I recall at the time, since I was around, that the shorthand descriptor was oil in Israel. Uh, That is to say that the United States at that particular moment, just like today, faced a dilemma in terms of control of the lifeblood of a modern capitalist economy. That is to say, the price of a barrel of oil. And Iraq, at that particular moment, was a major producer of oil. But even beyond that, it was felt that dislodging Saddam Hussein would be a kind of demonstration project, intimidating uh, other oil producers, uh, helping to gain leverage over Kuwait, another major oil producer, which the United States had helped to rescue from the clutches of Saddam Hussein uh, years before 2003. And then with regard to Israel, it's no secret that the uh, Israeli lobby plays an outsized role in U.S. domestic politics. It's not just, as you well know, not just the Jewish American community that supports the Israeli lobby. It has, shall we say, uh, by religious or bipartisan support uh, within the higher reaches of the U.S. ruling class. And it was felt that knocking off uh, Saddam Hussein would be in the interest of Israel, even though there was subsequent denial of that fundamental precept after the Iraqi war uh, did not turn out to necessarily uh, be the success it was touted to be. Likewise, today, there are rising tensions with Iran for similar reasons that led to the war against Iraq in 2003. And once again, you see the old reliables, the old standbys of oil and Israel uh, being motive forces with regard to that particular conflict. And so ultimately, I think that we can understand For example, the Iraq war, we can't understand how consent is manufactured. We can't understand why the ideas of a U.S. ruling elite trickle down into the consciousness of those who are not part of the U.S. ruling elite. And that is the first step, it seems to me, to reversing this ultimately harmful cycle. And we're speaking with one of the most gifted and insightful historians on racial matters and class matters melded together. They are symbiotic. Dr. Gerald Horn, who really has created 
his own distinguished approach to both national and international histories and has situated his works within the canons of history. And within that context, I want to go back to manufacturing consent and see if we must or if we have moved beyond it. The dominant theme, the media serves and propagandizes on behalf of the powerful societal interests that control them. The representatives of these interests have important agendas and principles that they want to advance, and they are well positioned to shape and constrain media policy. Well, this is normally not accomplished by crude intervention. You can get the Fox News or the Newsmax, but you get Yet again, the MSNBC. So they suggest, Ed Herman and Noam Chomsky, the selection of right-thinking personnel by the editors and working journalists who internalize the priorities and definitions of newsworthiness that conform to the institution's policy. So is this how we to understand the process, the structure that overcomes the selection and expression of news, if you will, that takes people to uh, our significantly rightward drift. And, of course, the uh, irony in this whole discussion is that the right wing has similar uh, critiques, or do they? But they certainly have mass critiques of the of the media as does the left so again flesh this out further for us is this really simply that uh, i'm hired uh, to do the work of the plutocracy who now is in a consolidated and controlling media and therefore I just put forth the dominant line. Is that how we are to understand the Rachel Maddow's, uh, uh, the Chris Hayes's, why there's no discourse on uh, political prisoners, why there is no uh, discourse on uh, the efforts to uh, erase uh, from the landmass the country and people and culture of Palestine and so on. Uh, that's a broad kind of brush that we're painting, but let's tackle it. Well, uh, to coin a phrase, we not only need to look at the monkey, we need to look at the organ grinder. What I mean by that, to repeat, is to look not only at those on screen, but those who are holding the string. I'm speaking of, once again, Rupert Murdoch, and if you look at the recent book by Michael Wolff, the journalist who has written repeatedly about Fox News, uh, he has suggested that uh, Fox News, believe it or not, uh, may not necessarily be in eternal construction, that uh, it's suffering a loss of audience, not least because of Newsmax, Newsmax, because of its uh, disputes with the Agent Orange, Donald J. Trump, uh, Tucker Carlson, for example, formerly a star on Fox News, was bounced out, and that gave us an idea of where power ultimately rests, not necessarily uh, with the subcontractor or employee, T uh, Tucker Carlson, uh, but with the man at the control, speaking of Rupert Murdoch, and these are profit-making enterprises in league with other profit-making enterprises that comprise the core of the U.S. ruling elite, and there are signals sent either explicitly or implicitly within that class as to what the appropriate line should be with regard to various controversies. And then there are other wrinkles as well. I spoke about the perhaps unpredictable future of Fox News. Well, recall that at the time, of the disastrous debacle in Iraq, there were similar uh, murmurings about the future of the New York Times, for example, of whether or not uh, it would even exist well into the 21st century. Now, of course, they hired the man we now know as Sir Mark Thompson from the BBC, who now, of course, is parachuted into CNN. But his arriving at the New York Times uh, helped the New York Times to reorient in a digital fashion, which at least for the short term seems to have rescued their fortunes. But 
there's another wrinkle with regard to that, because as we speak, there is a rather disturbing recrudescence of anti-Jewish fervor and anti-Semitism in the United States of America. You need look no further than X, the service formerly known as Twitter, which under the guidance, and I use that term advisedly, of Elon Musk, the man born in apartheid South Africa, has taken that particular social media octopus in a very ominous and dangerous direction. Uh, There's a hashtag that's trending on X as we speak, ban ADL, ban the Anti-Defamation League. They're tied up in all manner of disputes. And it reminds me of my first book on Hollywood, Class Struggle in Hollywood, which deals with the rise of the Red Scare in the late 1940s. At that particular moment, uh, there were similar trends. For example, the heads of the studios, the Warner Brothers, Harry Cohn, they were perceived as being not only correctly to be Jewish Americans, but also with a a kind of self-interest in preserving the fortunes of that community, up to and including uh, hiring communist screenwriters like John Howard Lawson, the founder of the Writers Guild, now, now on strike. And so they were understandably, perhaps, uh, terrified that their fortunes would be ripped away from them, just like the fortunes of other Jewish elites were ripped away from them in Europe in the 1930s and 1940s. Now, it might seem far-fetched to suggest that the Salzberger family that controls the New York Times or uh, Michael Bloomberg of the Bloomberg Business Week and uh, Bloomberg TV, et cetera, would have similar apprehensions and fears. Uh, But stranger things have happened. And in any case, uh, the question is, what are their perceptions? What are their perceptions of what the overall ruling class line is that compels them to toe the line and not to veer or diverge too far from that, even if one could posit they were so inclined, which of course is a matter of question. So in in the view of, again, returning to Ed Herman and Noam Chomsky's manufacturing consent, the, the basic line there is the underlying power sources that own the media that serve as primary definers of the news and that produce flack and proper thinking experts also play a key role in fixing basic principles and dominant ideologies. And that the media essentially acts as a lapdog of the dominant neoliberal ideology against leftists of all stripes. Well, that's not a dissimilar thought to the right. Is there something we're missing from that analysis that can make both the left and right so certain that the media is biased against them? Well, <laughs> the idea that the media is biased against the right is of a piece with this idea that so-called cancel culture is sweeping from the Atlantic to the Pacific, that the so-called wokeness agenda is destabilizing uh, not only the public school system, uh, but colleges and universities from the Atlantic to the Pacific. I think that the idea that the media is biased against the right is part of this scare agenda. Now, it's, it is fair to say that the dominant elements of the corporate media, including, for example, MSNBC, Washington Post, New York Times, are not necessarily 100% in sync with the right-wing and ultra-right agenda. And I think that because of that, then the right-wing floats this canard that actually those particular organs aforementioned are actually captives of some sort of left-wing wokeness, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion agenda, 
uh, which is far-fetched at best. Now, turning that coin over, <laughs> it's easy to understand what Chomsky and Herman are saying, because even today, uh, many intelligent voices on the left are fundamentally banned and barred from being quoted or cited or having their work reviewed in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, et cetera. And speaking of the Wall Street Journal, as you know, uh, that particular organ is also controlled by Rupert Murdoch, uh, he of the Fox News cabal. So we have to tread cautiously when drawing some sort of equivalence between how the corporate media deals with the left versus how it deals with the right. Well, I want to tell our listeners that this is Equal Rights and Justice, and we are the university of the streets, of the grassroots, of the people who are working to be educated, agitated, and organized for empowerment. And we do so this morning with the uh, brilliance and deep scholarship of Professor Dr. Gerald Horn. And I want to uh, just let you know know that we are going to share his wisdom and parse out throughout the next uh, two hours that we have this question of the mass media. And while we understand more fully the mass media and particular positions of great import that are informing mass consciousness now, we are going to similarly be uplifting and reconstructing, which WBAI has for over 63 years now, what a people's media should look like and do, or what I posited earlier on, which is an alternative to the society and the structure we live in. And that is a form of workers' democracy. And we're going to flesh out more what that looks like for Dr. Horn, whose work has always been not just to reveal and unearth, but to unearth the facts of history that contribute to us building the beloved community and egalitarian democracy society. So I want to just take a moment to tell you that we are privileged to have Dr. Horn with us this morning, but we can only do so if this station continues to keep on keeping on. And we are in the uh, last week of a sizzling summer searing fun drive to make our basic needs and pay our debts and bills such as to house our antenna, to have a brick and mortar location to pay our rent, to pay for such critical things as the health insurance for the numbers of people here who are the operational staff that make this expression possible. So I want you to take down this number, 212-209-2950, and I want you to give to this station because it is our station. It is the people's media, as you are hearing, and we'll talk more about that soon. But for you who understand that it is too critical, it is too essential to ever think about losing an institution, a media institution that represents, that represents the people, that is radio by the people, for the people. So I want you to call 212-209-2950 and just to let you know, and we'll talk more about it in the time to come, and that is that if you contribute $175 this morning, we have an exceptional package for you today, which we're called 
Breaking News. What is Breaking News? Well, it is two brand new books. Don't even have them physically in hand yet. Two brand new books about to be published by Dr. Gerald Horn. We'll talk more about the content. Two extraordinary books, and I want you to be able to have these as part of your intellectual arsenal, as part of your foundational material to build towards that beloved community that we seek out that is democratic, egalitarian, in a society that is run by those who do the work, and they are the ones who make the decision and control the state. So please do call and support this station and support Breaking News, WBAI, by calling 212-209-2950, As for Breaking News, $175 contribution. We're going to take a momentary musical break with somebody who really helped bring Breaking News and was of similar mind to what the media was and could be. And that was Danny Schechter, who we lost, who did extraordinary work around uh, the continent of Africa, and particularly in breaking the back of apartheid in South Africa. So let's hear one of his very rare pieces uh, that that he gave us. And uh, to give you a little momentum to, he did a hip hop piece. He did a rap piece. And this is to stimulate you to call 212-209-2950. Ask for breaking news and you will get the two brand new books. We will find out much more about the content. But trust me, it is the great wisdom of Gerald Horn, the research, the unearthing of structures of the development of class and the role of race that have everything to do with contributing to laying a foundation for us, for us to take this scholarship, use it as the activists we are to build that society that is democratic, egalitarian. And let's listen now to Danny Schechter, the news to sector, and then we will return while you call 212-209-29502, Dr. Gerald Horn. All right, we're going to fix that uh, technical problem. It's time for a shock. Are you bored? It's time to get bored. ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox News, Breaking News, Faking News, The Media War. It's time to get sore. This is some kind of bizarre reality TV show. How to keep your sanity while keeping up with the war. I work at ABC News, work at CNN. To see so many people, colleagues, if you will, acting as a megaphone for the military and for the administration. And unconscious of the effect they're having. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. There was never a question raised in the mainstream media about why we should really be going to war, only when we were going to go to war. The Pentagon also controls the timing of bad news, the heavy-handed way of managing the message. Managing the message. Trying to turn politics and the serious issues of our life into entertainment. Managing the message. All the networks wanted to have was a countdown to war. Overemphasis. Overkill. 48 hours to war. Dun, 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 dun. Showdown to Saddam. And what I'm seeing is not always believing. The purpose of journalism is to question the prevailing wisdom. Question the prevailing wisdom. I thought I answered that. Video war. Either with us or your guests. 
Well, that's just a slice of uh, a great journalist, filmmaker, anti-apartheid activist, Danny Schechter. So, Dr. Horn, <laughs> any thoughts on that uh, slice of uh, media wars by, by Danny Schechter as it informs our discussion about mass media? Well, I'm happy to see that you've underscored and underlined the contributions of Danny Schechter, who listeners may recall during the battle days of apartheid South Africa, uh, intervened in a muscular fashion by developing this program, South Africa Now, uh, which filled a vacuum insofar as it sought vigorously and assiduously to present the news of what was really going on in the southern cone of Africa as a, and in contrast to what we were seeing on our television screens uh, through Fox News, uh, through CNN, or reading in our newspapers uh, with regard to the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. And Danny Schechter in South Africa now is a model for what Pacifica and WBAI are both seeking to do today. That is to say, to provide a credible and informed alternative to the nostrums of the corporate media, and in the process, not only educating, but serving to agitate, and ultimately serving to organize organize amongst students in terms of them developing their own agenda to bring down the cost of education, organizing them around the working class. And as we know, we're staring at a deadline tonight of a possible strike, possible monumental strike by the United Auto Workers, historically the bellwether of the labor movement, the bellwether of the working class in general. And, of course, uh, trying to develop uh, information that will assist our seniors uh, who are oftentimes being forced into homelessness. There was a huge article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about homelessness has swept within its evil ambit an increasing number of seniors who find that their Social Security checks do not go a long way in the real Red hot real estate markets of, say, Southern Florida, Southern California, and other sites too numerous to mention. So, once again, I, I salute you, Mimi, personally, equal rights and justice as well, and WBAI and Pacifica for seeking to walk the steps of one Danny Schechter. Well, I thank you for putting us in that uh, that same light with uh, Danny Schechter. And I want to just return to uh, something that you had raised before, and that is um, – as, as part of the uh, false narrative and dangerous narrative of, of the media, which is now universal. And that is around the uh, misuse uh, conceptually and actually of the reality of anti-Semitism to preclude critique in any way, which is certainly what the ADL does, among other organizations, of Israel. 
and try to understand how despite the existence of anti-Semitism and very frequently from the evangelical community and the like, they have been convinced and taken up the you and cry of the Zionist state of, of Israel to completely seek to erase from the land the Palestinian people, the country of Palestine, its historic base and reality and existence, and eradicate its culture. So how are we to understand the role of the media there, for example, in using the claim of anti-Semitism to legitimize the Zionist state and the function of the Zionist state to now the evangelicals and certainly uh, the U.S. administration's Republican and Democratic parties and their hegemonistic interests in the Middle East. So parse that out for us. Well, you are certainly on point with regard to your critique of certain entities within the organized Jewish community, particularly in the United States of America. Uh, the ADL, for example, has burned bridges to the black community repeatedly in recent years and decades by excoriating uh, any uh, black intellectual or leader who has sought to speak out in favor of Palestinian rights. Uh, they have been scorned and scored as being anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, uh, et cetera. It reminds me, in a sense, of the travails and blunders of the organized Black community, speaking of NAACP in particular, uh, which has thrown overboard the idea that the Black community in the United States should build bridges to the progressive community overseas, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, in Africa, in Europe, in China, in Latin America, and therefore has left it dangerously isolated and perhaps even marginalized, despite his vast membership roles, as we face this perilous moment. The problem with regard to the former, speaking of the organized Jewish community, is that part of the issue is a total miscomprehension and misunderstanding of history. Uh, what I mean by that is referring to what I said at the top of our discussion, which is that there has been a systematic ignoring of recent scholarship. What I mean by that is you get the idea in the United States, even today, even with some of our friends on the left, that uh, a few hundred years ago in Europe, you had a, a so-called enlightenment that led to a retreat of the more egregious aspects of anti-Semitism, which thereby allowed uh, many Jewish Americans, for example, to rise to the highest levels of U.S. society, with the United States being an exemplar of this so-called enlightenment. Uh, but uh, that particular analysis uh, rests uneasily besides the newer analysis that has emerged, which talks about how England, which is supposedly the exemplar of the enlightenment, actually had expelled this Jewish community in the end of the 13th century, but by the 1500s was staring down the barrel of a gun wielded by Catholic Spain as England moved towards the Protestant faith. At the same time, there was this constant contestation over who would dominate ultimately the new territory supposedly discovered in the Americas, not to mention as complement the African slave trade. And so the Protestants, who were a minority sect at that particular moment in history, had little alternative but to try to build bridges to a Jewish community, which, by the way, was being uh, marginalized, to put it mildly, by the Spanish Inquisition, that is to say, declare your Catholicism or run the risk of being tortured or executed. And that's what ultimately led to this accommodation uh, to the Jewish community by the English-speaking world. But obviously, that's a rather fragile entente that can be unraveled whenever the material conditions that brought it into being tend to unravel, which is perhaps what we're facing today. And that is what I meant to suggest 
when I was talking about how many, not only on the left, but in the center as well, have ignored historical left lessons, I guess, because they're comfortable uh, with the older lessons, <laughs> which they learned in high school, but which uh, do th us little good when co contemplating and confronting the complexities of today. And, and, and by the way, we'll, we'll get a sense of what I'm talking about with these upcoming elections in Mexico, where the ruling party of AMLO, the current Mexican president, Manuel Lopez Obrador, has nominated a woman of Jewish Mexican descent to succeed her, to succeed him, excuse me. Now, my own contention is that uh, Mexico relatively, and I underline relatively, has done a better job of absorbing its black population than the United States has, of setting the numbers and size aside. I'm not so sure if they've done a better job of absorbing their population of Mexican descent, and if the successor to AMLO is defeated, uh, that will help to ratify what I'm suggesting at this moment. I want to con I want to continue to to look at uh, another uh, thesis that is uh, put forth again in manufactured consent, and I know is certainly something you've given considerable thought to and flesh this out, and that is the issue of anti-communism. It's the uh, dominant religion, if you will, of our cultural milieu. So many journalists who disagree with the established can be smeared with the label communist and forced on the defensive. Most have fully internalized the religion anyway, but they are all under great pressure to demonstrate their anti-communist credentials. Do you think that has... Uh, a good deal to do with the uh, uh, dumbing down, if you will, or the transformative politic of against someone. Uh, and maybe I'm uh, crediting her with too much, but uh, Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes, who came from the Nation magazine, whose uh, form of expression and particularly as their popularity uh, has grown and they are being put forth, indeed, Rachel Maddow as the, you know, pivotal uh, broadcaster for MSNBC, is, have they been forced into? And that, is that a, a critical, strategic, absolute uh, way that you can advance your career in uh, journalism by this, as I called it, really the dominant religion in our cultural milieu of uh, anti-communism, if you will. Well, you are correct in pointing to the profundity and importance of anti-communism as a kind of secular religion of the U.S. ruling class, which then uh, trickles down to many I'm afraid to say, in the working class, the middle class, and elsewhere. The United States has had a particular role to play with regard to the spreading of anti-communism, because my contention is that when slavery was abolished in the United States in the formal sense in 1865, the slave owners were expropriated without compensation, unlike in the British Caribbean, Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, etc., where the slave owners, now let's set aside the competing argument of reparations to the descendants of the enslaved for a moment, but in Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, etc., the slave owners uh, were uh, compensated. In fact, there are arguments to suggest that as recently as 2015, uh, their descendants were still being paid off. We all know about how slave owners in what is now Haiti uh, were paid off, helping to cripple the Haitian economy going forward from independence in 1804, a crippling that I'm afraid to say Haiti is still having to endure. So when socialist movements arise and flourish in the United States and worldwide in the 20th century, 
in the United States, oftentimes because of an inattention, once again, to relevant and recent scholarship, there was little understanding of the fact that socialists and communist parties were thought to portend the uncompensated expropriation of private property through nationalization or government seizure of the commanding heights of the economy, which then stirred oftentimes unprocessed memories of what had befallen the slave-owning class post-1865 when their property was taken without a compensation of plunging many into impoverishment and misery, helping to generate the rise of so-called white terrorism through the Ku Klux Klan. And that particular cycle of iniquity continues to bedevil us even in 2023. Now, I say that despite the fact that there are encouraging signs that the potency of anti-communism is not as strong today as it once was. For example, post-1945, when you had the Red Scare, when the Taft-Hartley legislation was enacted, which helped to sabotage uh, trade unions going forward. But I took careful note of the remarks of the leader of the Screen Actors Guild when they went out on strike some weeks ago, and their leader, Fran Drescher, gave remarks dripping with the militancy of class struggle. And Drescher gave remarks dripping with the militancy of class struggle. In an earlier era, uh, she would have been red-baited and denounced as a communist seditionist, but unless I've missed the story, that did not emerge in 2023, which is a hopeful sign, because we need to recognize that Ostensibly, anti-communism was meant to bedevil communists and socialists, and that it did. But it also helped to delegitimize any sort of discourse that was even vaguely left of center, which you see unfolding as we speak. Reference my previous remarks on the attempt to excoriate diversity, equity, and inclusion to suggest that so-called cancel culture is sweeping through the land when actually uh, we can only hope that anti-racism and anti-sexism and anti-homophobia are, street, uh, are sweeping through the land. And I think that because of the toxic after effects of the anti-communist surge post-1945, that's one of the reasons why it's been so difficult uh, for our friends on the left to absorb a uh, new historical lessons because the new historical lessons uh, oftentimes are, shall we say, left of center and therefore run into the buzzsaw of anti-communism, Fran Drescher notwithstanding, is still with us. And again, we are speaking with Dr. Gerald Horn. And we are trying to be the media dissectors, understand the current stories that should be covered and covered with a, a empathy, sympathy, political leaning towards the oppressed and the depressed people as opposed to the uh, plutocrats who are the ones who exploit and destroy, whether it is the planet, whether it is the maintenance of an inequity economically that leads to the enormity of uh, wage disparities, income, wealth, distribution, and thus terrifying perennial poverty for whole groups of people, whether it is propelling forward uh, increased militarism or indeed whether it is uh, facilitating and ginning up 
the proverbial biases that exist against immigrant groups, against people of African ancestry, against Latinx people, against people who are uh, choose their own style and, and life of who and how to love, i.e. the uh, enormous uh, pressure and indeed life threatening situation towards the LGBTQIA communities uh, today, the incredible misogyny that is now the dominant uh, legal mechanism, i.e. Uh, the uh, elimination of uh, abortion on, on demand and self-determination for women's bodies as primary issues. These are the things that we're talking about. And these are the things that media give us our dominant view on. And so we are with uh, Dr. Gerald Horn, and we are discussing really racism and internationalism and resistance to the current state of the media and extolling, which we uh, are doing merely by having this conversation, the Pacifica Network, WBAI, that tells it like it is. And we want you, we want you to make sure this institution, this legacy broadcast institution continues to keep on keeping on. I want to knock it out of the ballpark uh, in the next hour with you calling and saying, I'm committing a $175 pledge to or, or you can do more, certainly, but at least this morning, a $175 pledge to WBAI in this equal rights and justice time slot to make sure this institution keeps on keeping on. And there's a special gift if you do call in and pledge, and we're calling the a gift that we have for you, and it's the gift of knowledge. It is the gift of uh, Dr. Gerald Horn, his two new books, his readers, on which really deal with racism, internationalism, and resistance, and in a very personal way, the collective uh, knowledge of, I think, what, at least 50 decades of work of Dr. Gerald Horn. Please Please call 212-209-2950, 212-209-2950, as for breaking news. Make sure that we continue as media so we can have these discussions. And one of the things that I want to turn to, Dr. Horn, now is as part of this discussion, I was raising the issue of anti-communism to what degree does that have everything to do with the way the media in, in, in mass is ginning up and the saber rattling against China? And how are we supposed to and, and, and understand uh, the way the media is treating the administrative antipathy, corporate antipathy, etc., to uh, to China. Well, anti-communism has quite a bit to do with this emerging new Cold War targeting the People's Republic of China. However, there are more complexities in 2023 going forward than there were during the, shall we say, old Cold War with the then socialist camp led by the Soviet Union. As we all know, U.S. corporations, including Elon Musk, Tesla, Microsoft, Apple, KFC, etc., are heavily invested in the Chinese economy. Likewise, you cannot begin to explain the steady stream of administration heavyweights, such as Secretary of State Blinken, Secretary of the Treasury Yellen, Secretary of Commerce Romando, Climate Czar John Curry, uh, to Beijing without understanding how there has been a coupling of the U.S. and Chinese economies in recent decades, certainly since the overtures to China by then-President Nixon and his 
of uh, his aide, Henry Kissinger, in the early 1970s. Uh, what that means is that even though Mr. Biden is clearly embarked on a path to encircle the People's Republic of China, including his trip to Vietnam just a few days ago, despite the fact that both Vietnam and China are led by communist parties, they have tensions and contradictions that stretch, stretch back a millennium or so, which obviously calls into question the entire rationale for the ill-fated, ill-advised war in Vietnam ending ignominiously in 1975 with the U.S. ejection from that Southeast Asian nation, uh, leaving in its wake uh, millions of dead Vietnamese, not to mention 50,000 plus uh, dead U.S. nationals now memorialized with a monument in Washington, D.C. And so it's not going to be easy to execute this new Cold War against China because the United States might have given up so much ground in the previous decades with regard to its relationship with China, up to and including the People's Bank in Beijing buying U.S. Treasury bills to the tune of billions, if not in the low trillions, although, footnote, uh, the People's Bank has been steadily liquidating those Treasury bills in recent days, weeks, and months, uh, which will shed light, I'm afraid to say, on the impending government shutdown of September 2023, which is looming, ignited by these maniacal, obsessive right-wing Republicans in Washington, D.C. And so you see this contradiction. On the one hand, the United States is trying to encircle China, would like to see the overthrow of the Chinese Communist Party, like the Soviet Communist Party was overthrown uh, some decades ago. But at the same time, the economies are coupled. The U.S. government is heavily dependent upon the People's Bank uh, continuing to make loans. And so that's going to lead, it seems to me, to a policy that will be somewhat schizophrenic in the metaphorical sense, that will ultimately seem to be irrational. And likewise, it calls into question its ultimate success. But there's another wrinkle that we need to focus on, which obviously we should focus on in this country, which is that if China does rise to be the preeminent power of the 21st century, which seems to be the case, that then will raise search searching and searing questions about the future and fate of white supremacy, uh, which has been uh, so essential to the fortunes of the capitalist world going back to the battle days of the unlimited African slave trade. And although there are those who would suggest that uh, white supremacy will continue to motor on as if this were 1950, uh, I think, once again, that may be a severe underestimation of the forces at play. Journalists are certainly dependent on, on sources. The most convenient sources are large, well-organized entities in the midst of newsworthy events who issue press releases. For example, by far the easiest source for the latest news about a foreign war is what else? The Pentagon. Furthermore, the Pentagon will not always, is certainly not, in fact, trustworthy. It enjoys a presumption, though, of trustworthiness. Now, with that reality, we also constantly see a stream, which I, I must say as a uh, public defender lawyer uh, for some decades, uh, is always striking to me that... Uh, Again, and I will pick this as the kind of apex, whether it's CNN or MSNBC of cable news, allegedly, uh, you know, kind of liberalcy, uh, which is how it's viewed. I don't think I even remember them ever having a defense attorney on. Their sources are almost exclusively prosecutors when analyzing an issue, FBI agents, 
uh, and and not recantant uh, CIA agents of of any kind who have left the agency and revealed its uh, dastardly machinations against a democracy and its murderous proclivities. So, <laughs> with that. I want you to also comment on on how that informs uh, the 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 nature of the media and how we are to understand uh, this absolute reliance on the so-called experts, if you will, to confirm and comment upon news, which is so incestuous in terms of the relationships between governments and corporations, uh, really conservative think tanks, and some of the most dastardly uh, conservative institutions that operate against any form of uh, democratic uh, people's uh, governance. Well, that is a sound and solid point to raise. And I was thinking also of retired generals commenting on U.S. foreign policy, commenting on the new Cold War with China, uh, commenting during the days of the Iraq War on that particular uh, debacle. Uh, In some ways, these retired generals who oftentimes sign contracts with a particular news outlet, be it CNN or MSNBC or Fox, have been misleading the U.S. public generally and and actually misleading the U.S. ruling class as a whole, which brings me to one of our overriding points of this morning, which is that it's not only our constituency, the working class in the first instance, the poor in the first instance, who need Pacifica Radio, But it seems to me that in a rather bizarre, upside-down sense, if you're in the U.S. ruling class, if you are in the investor class, which means you need up-to-the-moment, up-to-date intelligence about the balance of forces domestically and globally, you will simply not get that from MSNBC, New York Times, Washington Post. You would have to incorporate Pacifica in your diet if you really want to know what's going on, if you want to get an idea of where U.S.-China relations are going, because if you just rely upon the Washington Post, for example, you'll be stuck with the one-sided analyses of Josh Rogan, for example, and Uberhawk. You will be stuck with the analysis of David Ignatius, their top national security opinion writer, who is no more than a stenographer, for the State Department and the CIA, and therefore you will get rather warped intelligence. And that warped intelligence is what leads the United States into one debacle after another. And so that is one of the reasons amongst many why we continue to need Pacifica Radio in general and WBAI in particular, uh, not only as noted, for our privileged constituency, speaking of the poor and the working class in the first place, but for any who are seeking to develop an analysis of what's really going on domestically and globally for whatever purpose you need that information. Did I not tell you that this is Equal Rights and Justice? I'm Mimi Rosenberg with a special today, two hours Two hours with the wisdom of the most, uh, I think, uh, cogent, uh, insightful historian of my generation, and that is Dr. Gerald Horn who takes us so far behind understanding that, ah, the images of the uh, media as uh, cantankerous and obstinate and uh, obsequious in their search for, for truth and defense of justice is an absolute fraud. And why that is, um, in their actual practice, they defend the economic, social, and political agendas of the privileged groups that dominate domestic society, the state, and the global order. Order. And this is what we are instructed in. And that's what we are looking at this morning. And we are so delighted to have Dr. Horn uh, with us. And I want to again give you the number. 
I want to give you the number to call now. Now, while we have copies, which Dr. Horn has been generous generous enough to provide for us, aside from his time and energies, which he gives freely to WBAI. We have his two new books, which we are calling, and we are going to discuss those in a moment. But we have copies of them. We have uh, really 10 copies per hour at $175 contribution, although we always urge you to make more if you can, if you can, to support WBAI. We have two, uh, you know, phenomenal books by Dr. Horn that are a compilation of his decades of research and knowledge around the world to propel forward the interests of the working class and to build an egalitarian democratic society of the working class, of the workers, by the workers, for the workers, where they make the decisions. How critical is that to have somebody with this kind of intellect and scholarship and perseverance talking to us? And one of the things I do want to tell you before I uh, hit my next uh, uh, talking point with uh, Gerald is This is a strategic time to make sure that our institution, our institution, our legacy institution of 63 years does not go quiet into that good night because we haven't been able to support it. And the reason that we can do what we do is because we are not encumbered by commercialism. We are not controlled by the plutocracy. So we're able to bring up these ideas which are partisan and of concern to do what? To educate, agitate, and organize, to empower, to empower you, the people, for the realization of that beloved community, which is inherently one that must be democratic. And in order to be democratic, it must be egalitarian. And the decision-making must be made by those who actually do the work in the society. That's what we stand for. That's what we bring to you. And if you want this to continue to keep on keeping on, because it informs all the issues that you're concerned about, we have yet to do our special anniversary, which we will do on the rebellion at Attica. We have yet to do a full and comprehensive recollection and recordation of the issues that are still to be fleshed out on the other 9-11, which was the Chilean coup. Dr. Horn has mentioned to us the fact that uh, we have programming here that deals with uh, and has for, for decades the uh, supremacy, if you will, the advent, the development, and the development of power and state power of the working class, of labor, those who do the work, reaping the benefits from their work and not being ripped off by the robber barons. We have the issues uh, within the discussion of, of labor and work, of reparations. When will we, when will the African American peoples be paid for the work that they've done and what they committed to the building of this society? So much that is, is encompassed in WBAI that must, must, must Keep on keeping on, and we need you to do it so we will not be holding, be beholding to the corporatocracy, to the plutocracy, to commercialism. But you have to call right now, 212-209-2950, and ask for, as our gift to you, for your commitment of $175 during this little time that we have left. It's gone so quickly because there's so much to discuss and so much to bring to you and make sure that we have the opportunities to continue to do that for months and years to come. 212-209-2950, a $175 pledge for the books 
the brand new books that Dr. Horn has donated to us, which we're calling Breaking News, and they are, and they are, and we'll discuss more of the content of them, but something that you must have as the intellectual, theoretical, international, anti-racist foundation on which to base your, our activism for a workers' democracy to be set up by the people, for the people, we make the decisions. 212-209-2950. Ask for breaking news, $175 contribution or more. And with that, Dr. Horn, I, I want to ask you about the coverage and how are we supposed to understand the coverage of uh, Africa uh, on uh, the, again, I would take what is, is characterized as the more liberal uh, news media. What's the problem there? It would seem to me that, among other things, uh, Africa is continuously treated in a, a quasi-colonialist way where the issue of its own agency and self-determination of the African countries is completely disregarded. Well, I'm glad you raised that topic because it allows me, once again, to return to the topic of the morning, which is press coverage. I happen to monitor Voice of America, the U.S. government broadcaster, which focuses quite a bit on Southern Africa, not surprising given the state of U.S. investment in that region, which contains not only gold but lithium, which is important for the green economy. Their reporter from South Africa, Darren Taylor, is not only anti-communist, which, as noted, is part of the secular religion of the United States, but uh, his reports oftentimes border on racism. But what's even more remarkable is that Darren Taylor also is the correspondent in that part of the world for the Epic Times. The Epic Times is this hyperbolic, hysterical, anti-China rag, which is also fervently pro-Trump. And I've oftentimes scratched my head and wondered why it is that the Voice of America under the Biden administration, which tells us, this is part of their calling card, that they're rather stringently anti-Trump. Why do they uh, have a reporter that uh, is pro-Trump, and not only that, but uh, Mr. Biden is heavily reliant and dependent upon the black vote, and yet anti-blackness is also part of the calling card of Darren Taylor, which, of course, brings us to another arm of the media. Uh, Speaking of X, the site formerly known as Twitter, uh, where their new controller and major owner, Elon Musk, who, of course, was born in apartheid South Africa, has been touting this counterfeit and bogus notion of so-called white genocide unfolding in the southern cone of Africa, that is to say, an alleged and purported reign of terror against those of European descent in that part of the world, uh, which is obviously ludicrous since that community, uh, even in 2023, continues to control the commanding heights of the economy, not only in South Africa, the uh, number two economy on the continent, uh, but throughout a good deal of that uh, sub-region. And then that brings us to the latest development, which are these regime changes that have been taking place in Niger, in Gabon, uh, coupled with the other regime changes in the Sahel, speaking of Mali and Burkina Faso and Guinea Conakry and even Chad, what's remarkable there in terms of the press coverage is that the U.S. media uh, is not necessarily shy about doing at least a subtle critique of French neocolonialism in Africa. But this reminds me of what was unfolding in Africa in the late 1950s, when a young senator by the name of John F. Kennedy was seeking to establish his credibility by critiquing French neocolonialism and colonialism in Algeria, 
which of course surges in independence in 1962. Uh, as it turns out, what was unfolding is that Senator then President Kennedy was trying to elbow aside France so that the United States could take its place. And in fact, what the media has missed with regard to Africa and so-called French West Africa today is that that particular process may be unfolding. For example, in Gabon, uh, oftentimes escaping attention, is that the new leader, um, General Nguema, I guess I call him President Nguema today, is a major property owner in Silver Springs, Maryland, and Hyattsville, Maryland. That uh, a leading general in Niger, a General Barmore, uh, studied at the National Defense University in Washington uh, on the banks of the Potomac River, and it's been left to the intercept, not part of the corporate media, to be sure, to report on all of the curious connections between military leaders trained in the United States and these regime changes that have unfolded. So to make a long story short, uh, once again, the reportage on Africa by the corporate media has been severely and sorely lacking, which once again underscores and underlines the absolute importance of Pacifica Radio, WBAI in particular, for those who want to keep informed, and I should not ignore the underlying point, which is that a country, the United States, which to a certain degree was grounded in anti-Blackness because of a need to rationalize and justify the unlimited African slave trade, which on its face uh, violated uh, religious principles, violated the charter of this country, speaking of the Declaration of Independence in the U.S. Constitution. So you had to excommunicate Black people from the human family and treat them as if, or treat us, I should say, as if we were cattle and horses, so that these odious forms of commerce, such as slavery and the African slave trade, could continue. And despite our enormous struggles in recent decades and centuries, uh, I don't think that it comes as a newsflash to suggest that anti-blackness is still an animating factor in U.S. culture, which then bleeds into coverage of contemporary Africa, which once again underlines and underscores the magnitude of the debt of gratitude we owe to Pacifica Radio and WBAI, which merits our support. Well, Dr. Horn, that uh, takes me now to much of what you've been uh, discussing. We've been uh, really expounding on the theme that the, the media is a profit-seeking free market and with a dominant ideology.